Well, my, my family has a tradition. Um, every year on New Year's Day, the Moore family gathers together in my grandma and grandpa's living room and dining room and really any place we can find a spot to stuff people um, for a meal. For the last 40 years, my grandma started a tradition right around the time I was born um, of doing fondue on New Year's Day. I don't know if you've ever had fondue before. This is not like chocolate fondue. This is like the real deal fondue. And this is just one of the tables that is stuffed with my brothers and cousins and nephews and nieces and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And there's 30 to 40 of us, usually on New Year's Day, gathered around one of these tables, slowly cooking pieces of meat together over burning pots of oil. And there's like a whole system that we've got, like you have to be an electrical engineer to be able to wire all those pots. Like if you can see that, that olive green one right at the front of the picture, that pot is like the original Moore family fondue pot. That thing's like 40 plus years old right there. And, and whether you're my 93 year old grandfather or my uh, cousin's six month old baby, we're all there around the table gathered together. We all wear our Ohio State gear there watching some football and being together. And, and there's several things I love about this time, this meal. One is it's a meal that's designed to be eaten slowly, right? Like every, you have to cook each individual piece of food and, and the oil and you take it off. And so it's, it's an hour, an hour and a half of just sitting there, gathering, talking, catching up, um, doing life together. The second thing I love about this meal is, is what surrounds me is the fact that I'm in this place where, where of everyone who knows me, these people know me the best, and, and yet they love me in spite of that, right? It, it's a place where I can look down the table and the bonds that connect us together are so much greater than the bonds that would divide us. I can look around me and I can see this legacy, this generational faith and love and support that's informed so much about who I am and my understanding of, of even the gospel and of, of my own identity in Christ. And at the same time, I can feel the, the weight and the responsibility of that, of living that out for the generations who will come after me. I love the meal because of, of what it represents to me and because of the people who share it with me. You see, it's, it's far more than an afternoon lunch on New Year's Day. It, it has a far greater purpose and a far greater significance. Perhaps you have a tradition similar to this in, in your own family. This summer, we, we've been talking about and looking at these disciplines of grace in, in our lives. These, these, these um, practices that we see throughout the pages of the New Testament, throughout the story of the Bible, that they orient our lives around the foundational truth of God's grace that we celebrate and talk about that's transformed us as followers of Jesus. These patterns that, that we can implement intentionally into our lives that that enable us to understand more deeply and to experience more holistically and to display more powerfully this grace that has changed us and to do so in the course of, of our everyday lives. This morning, we're going to talk about the practice of eating and gathering as a, as a discipline of grace. And we were just joking a few moments ago. We looked at the bulletin, saw eating and gathering, and was like, I've got this one down, you know, like, this is an easy one. Um, and yet, like all of these practices, when we talk about it, it's, it's not merely the, the practice, but also the heart posture behind it that ultimately connects us with, with the grace that this seeks to inform in our lives. It's, it's purposeful. It's not just merely the meal that we eat, but who we're with and, and what's taking place around the table at that time. 
So when we talk about eating and gathering as, as a spiritual discipline, we're not talking about entertaining, although they can at times look very similar, but they have a very different objective in mind. See, when Jesus is teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God, what it looks like and the meaning of it, he says, think of it like this. This is in, in Matthew 22 and Luke 14. Jesus talks about this king who is celebrating his son's wedding and, and he wants to extend the invitation to, to the community to come and join him in the midst of this celebration, to be there at the banquet table. And he sends out his servants and he sends them out first and, and to the people that you might expect, to, to the known and, and to the, 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 the people with, with um, honor and position in society. And some of them say, well, you know, I'm, I'm super busy right now. I'm, I, I got a lot going on. I just bought this piece of land. Um, I just got married. We're not going to be able to make it. And the king says, keep going. Keep, keep extending the invitation. Take it into the alleys and the back ways and, and find the blind and the lame and the sick and the poor and invite them in. I, I want them to be there at my table. And as Jesus is telling this story, as he's giving this powerful countercultural description, he says to his disciples, see, this is what it's like in the kingdom of God. This is, this is what life in his kingdom looks like. So when we think about this practice of, of eating and gathering, what this looks like, we have to keep in mind this, this sort of kingdom vision that Jesus has been communicating to the church, what, what he is ushering in. And so I want to begin this morning by looking at the grand invitation. The grand invitation. I'm borrowing this phrase from James Bryan Smith in his book, The Good and beautiful life where he talks about the practice of, of hospitality being rooted in, in the invitation that Jesus extends. I grew up um, with two brothers. I'm the middle child. One is older and one is younger. And my older brother is four years older than me. So I, I, I've said this before, but I was perfectly positioned in life to constantly be in a stage to annoy him, right? Like no matter what stage of life he was in, I was just young enough to kind of like push his buttons. But I can remember when he was in high school and I was just getting into middle school and, and he always had his friends coming over doing things and, and always just desperately wanting to be a part of that, right? Like those kids in my head, like this was, this was the cream of the crop. These were the cool kids. These were, and when they would come over to our home, it was just the annoying little brother who wanted to be a part of the football game or to go and hang out in my brother's room when they were in there doing whatever they were doing. And I always wanted to be a part of it. And it was always met with a closed door, right? You're, you don't belong here, right? We all know that feeling. You're not a part of this. This isn't for you. I just last week at this time was flying home from Ecuador. And, and again, we all know this feeling, right? When you're sitting in coach and you can just see beyond the curtain what's happening up there, like people are being fanned and there's like nonstop food coming and their, their chairs literally turn into beds. Like, and you look and you see that and you know like that's, they get something I don't get. This, this was the predominant narrative of what people perceived or understood about the kingdom of God in, in the mind of a first century Jewish man or woman. That when God ushered in his kingdom, those who were going to be involved, this was going to be set aside for the elite, for those who had their act together, for this select few to be a part of it. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at a familiar passage this morning where Jesus is, again, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. He's beginning to describe and communicate this vision for the kingdom of God. And this is what he says. He says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, 
for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, oftentimes we, we read what's commonly known as the Beatitudes, and, and we think of these sets of, of attributes that we ought to add to our lives. Or we think of this as this prescription for, for what it requires to be called blessed. But see, I don't, I don't think this is what Jesus is offering in these verses. I don't think these are attributes to be added to our lives or a prescription for blessing. I think what Jesus is, is offering here are invitations. Again, the, the, the predominant view is, is that the kingdom of God was for the select few. In fact, if in, in first century Judaism... The, the, the lines that were drawn about who was going to be on the inside were pretty narrow. For, you had to be Jewish, obviously. So anybody who's Gentile, anybody who's a non-Jew, they're on the outside. You also had to be a male because at the time, culturally, women were considered like second-class citizens. So you had to be a man in order to be included in, in what God was going to do in his kingdom and this restorative work. You had to be a faithful keeper of the law. And so anybody who was deemed in that society or cultural to be a quote unquote sinner, they're on the outside looking in. You had to be physically whole and healthy and put together and mentally as well. So the sick and the blind and, and those who are emotionally hurting, they're on the outside because obviously in order to be in that condition, you're, you're cursed. You also had to be wealthy because the poor were seen as, as um, again, somehow outside of God's blessing. And wealth was a, a clear picture of God's blessing, blessing. And so if you didn't meet those qualifications, if that didn't describe you, then you are on the outside looking in when it came to what God was going to do in his kingdom. It's an it's, it's exclusive list of the elite. And so as Jesus is communicating, as he's teaching this, most of the people sitting on that hillside listening to him know that they're on the outside looking in, that they saw themselves as disqualified. And then Jesus shows up and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Dallas Willard translates that, that phrase, poor in spirit, as, as spiritual zeros. Blessed are the spiritual zeros. Because they're invited. They're invited in. Blessed are those who mourn because they're included. They're welcome in this kingdom that, that I'm ushering in. Blessed are the meek or the, the defenseless because you're invited. And he goes on and on. The, the Beatitudes, when we read Matthew chapter 5, these are these invitations of inclusion. Again, um, James Bryan Smith says, Jesus opens the Sermon on the Mount with the radical teaching that these people are invited to the great banquet. And this is absolutely mind-blowing to those who are hearing Jesus teach this. So why, as we talk about this whole idea of eating and gathering, this practice in our lives, why do we start here? How, how do the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 help us practice the discipline of eating and gathering as a way of, of experiencing and expressing extending grace? See, we have to begin with the awareness or the understanding that we are the recipients of, of God's invitation to his table in order to begin to see our table as a means to offer the same to someone else. Now, as a kid, sometimes when, when my parents would throw a, a birthday party for, for me or one of my brothers, that sort of thing, it was sometimes we'd go to this roller skating rink that was in the next town, or we'd go bowling, or if we were really good, right, if we had been really good that year, it was like Chuck E. Cheese, which now as a parent is the worst place in the world, you know. 
And, and not only would my parents, naturally, they would say, hey, you, this is for you. You get to be a part of this. We are extending this invitation to you, but there's a, there's a benefit that came along with it. There's an implication that came along with it. You get, to, you get to invite five of your friends. This thing that we're doing, this is for you. We're extending this invitation to you, but you get to bring someone with you. See, the practice of, of hospitality is rooted in God's invitation to us through Jesus. Eating, eating and gathering together then is, is an opportunity to both extend and to celebrate that same invitation in community with the people around us. It, it's, it's a tangible expression of that same invitation to our family and our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers. And sometimes, as we see throughout the pages of, of the New Testament, sometimes to the complete stranger, to the foreigner in our lives. Our call to invite is the result of the awareness, the recognition, our understanding that we have been invited, that this is what Jesus has done for us. And so there's, there's two sort of practices that emerge in the pages of the New Testament as a result of that. The first is, and let's talk about this, is extending the invitation. It's, it's about extending the invitation. So this is that practice of eating and gathering, setting aside intentional time and space to do life with people who have not yet come to an understanding of the grace that Jesus offers them. They, they've not yet come to the place where they understand the invitation that Jesus has given to them. And so we invite them to be around our table as a reflection of his table. When I was in high school, my best friend lived about half a block away. And, and we did so much life together. We were constantly hanging out, weekends, class stuff. We would study together. We would just, that's how we did life. And, and I was constantly going over to his house, and he was constantly going over to my house. So much so that it came to the point where we were more or less treated like family. Like you would walk up to the door, you didn't need to knock, you just kind of let yourself in and showed up and opened the fridge and started eating, right? And Vince would do this with my family and I would do this at his house and it was kind of how we operated. And, and we had the opportunity because we were such close friends in high school, we, we would kind of get to sample what it was like to be a part of each other's family. I, I got to taste what it was like to be a part of the Barnhart family. Like even our moms sometimes would treat the other one like a son. Um, it, Vince's mom was French and spoke, obviously, French. And, and sometimes when she was upset with us, she would start rattling stuff off in French. But I took French in high school. <laughs> and I could tell what she was saying. Um, and so could he. And you kind of just picked it up with the jesters alone. But that's kind of how it was. Like, we got, to, we got to taste what it was like to be a part of this family. See, this is the image. This is the practice of hospitality that we see unfolding all the time throughout the pages of the New Testament. Come and taste. See what it's like to be a part of this family. Come experience it. This is a practice that we see in the life of Jesus um, time and time again, where he is constantly sitting down with with that group of people, people who, who were seen as being dismissed or on the outside, sitting down with them in order to do life with them, in order to speak love and value to tax collectors and prostitutes and people that, 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 that culture saw and identified as notorious sinners. There's a passage in, in Mark chapter 2. I love this example. Jesus is calling his disciples, he's getting them together, and, and he calls a man named Levi that we commonly know as, as Matthew, who is a tax collector, who is in that cultural, uh, in, in the mind of a first century Jewish man or woman, um, a traitor to their people and a liar and a cheater. Um, we have a tendency when we read this, by the way, to, to think of, of Jesus' actions here as kind of like... Um, sticking it to the man, right? Like he's, he's bold and he's courageous. That's because we don't live with the mindset of a first century Jewish man or woman. Like if, if you were to 
think of this in our culture, if Jesus is sitting down across the table with um, a sex offender or with a white nationalist, like our, our reaction probably wouldn't like, yeah, Jesus, go show him the love. You know, we'd be like, what is he doing? That's what, that's what the people are feeling here in this moment. When Jesus sits down with these people and is doing life with them, they're, in their heart and mind, they're feeling, what are you doing, Jesus? And this is what, this is what happens. So he's called Levi to be one of his disciples, this tax collector. And so Levi throws a party and he gets his friends together. This is Mark chapter 2, verse 15. He says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And see, Jesus' words here are instructive to us. He spent time eating and doing life with those who needed healing. Those who saw themselves as the outsider who were dismissed and disqualified. And he does so in order to speak grace and to show them that they are loved and value that they have a part in his kingdom. They experienced grace around the table, and he teaches us as the recipients, as the benefactors of this same grace to us to do the same for others, to to offer that same invitation that has been transformational in our lives, to use our table and our homes as a mean as a means to a tangible expression of that same invitation to the people God has put around us. That word hospitality in the Greek, it's a, it's a compound word. It, it, it begins with the word phileo, which is one of the Greek words that's translated love. Um, like Philadelphia, the, it's like familial love, the city of brotherly love. It's, it's this... Um, Love And the second half of the word is the word xena, which we've heard over the last several years of xenophobia, right? People who are afraid of of foreigners. The word for hospitality leads love for the foreigner, love for the outsider, love for somebody outside of your tribe, your group, your people, whoever this is, your circle of friends. It literally means to love the outsider by inviting them in bringing them into experiences, whether that's their physical reality or whether that's their spiritual reality or both. Jesus models to us this vision of understanding our homes and our tables as a place where people experience grace and understand that they're loved and valued to invite them in. Rosaria Butterfield wrote a book entitled The Gospel Comes with a House Key where she just describes this vision of the gospel being lived out in Christian communities in what she calls radical ordinary hospitality. And she describes it this way. She says, radical ordinary hospitality is this. It's using your Christian home in a daily way that seeks to make strangers, neighbors, and neighbors family of God. It's a compelling vision of how we understand the space around our table, what it's to be used for. You think about this logo for Chapel Street that we talk about and you see on a regular basis. And the Pastor Bruce talked about this when we were talking about the neighborhood serve coming up in August. But many of you know that the term Chapel Street does not represent a, a street that our church first began on. There's no campus that's on a street named Chapel in our history. Rather, it speaks to the fact that we as a community want to understand each of our homes to be a chapel on our street. That there's an outworking of the vision and the call that we believe God has placed in our lives on every street where there's one of us who calls that neighborhood home. In fact, that that little cross on on the left-hand side of the logo there is both to, to be reminiscent of the cross of Christ, of course, but it is also meant to represent an intersection, uh, a street, 
the cul-de-sac that you live on, the, the, the place you call home. This is what the vision that we believe God has given us to understand our homes as a place where the people in our neighborhood know that they're loved and they're cared for. What if, what if our home was the place where when somebody in our community knew that they were in need right now, that I can go there. And if they can't help me, they can find someone who can. Or what if our homes was the place when somebody was hurting or experiencing loss or they were going through a difficult time that I know I can go there. Somebody's going to be there to pray with me or to care for me or to cry with me or just to do life with me. What if we became known for that? What if your home became known for that? That's, that's the vision of the church, and it's, it's the message that Jesus has presented to us about what this looks like to follow him. Lastly, then, and quickly, we also see this practice of, of eating and gathering to be a celebration of the invitation. A celebration of, of the invitation. I told you that I, last week I was flying back from Ecuador, and I was there with a group of students who were serving and doing life together, an incredible experience as it always is. And I've led these trips for years in the past. And this group is like so many that have gone before them. When they get back to the States, one of their first reactions to coming back is we, we got to get back together. Like, let's, let's go get ice cream together. Let's go see a movie together. Let's continue to do life together. It's, it's a natural reaction. Why? Because they've experienced something transformational over the last two weeks of their life together. Because they experienced something that, that the rest of us, when we're not there, it's, we can hear about it and we might appreciate it, but we don't understand it because we weren't there in that moment with them. And so, so there's this natural tendency to say, let's, let's get back to the Let's continue to, to spend time together. Think about in Acts chapter 2. The, the disciples have gathered together in Jerusalem. They've just seen Jesus ascend into heaven and to leave them with the Great Commission, to go out and to tell the world about who he is and what he's done. And then the Holy Spirit falls on them in Pentecost. There's, there's the launching, the birth of the church. Peter stands up in Jerusalem. He begins to preach the message of Jesus Christ. Thousands of people are responding to this. And in Acts chapter 2, we see what happens. We see their reaction to this incredibly transformational experience. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is their response after, after experiencing all this together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, after this incredibly transformational experience, this, this early group of of followers of Jesus, they could not help but be together. We, we get this incredible picture of what it looks like to follow Jesus in community. And I, I, I understand that this could be construed as this, this sermon about the importance of coming to church, or I could tell you about the importance of being a part in a small group, both of which I am an absolute huge advocate of. I believe in. It's important. But I also don't want to dilute this down to sort of a, a programming issue in our minds. Gathering together, eating together, doing life together, it's not about a program. It's about a shared experience of gospel transformation in our lives. It's about you and I choosing to pursue Jesus and his kingdom together. It's about understanding firsthand what has happened about this grand invitation that Jesus has, has spoken to us and getting together in order to remember and to celebrate and to, to be renewed in that same invitation to be able to experience it together in community so that 
so that the world will know it, that they will discover it, that they will respond to the same grace that we ourselves have received from Jesus. It's doing life together as, as fellow followers of Jesus and celebrating his grand invitation in our lives. So this week, as, as I wrap up, I want to I wanna give you just a couple of quick challenges. The first is, and, and, and I've got two for you this week. So the first is, I, I, I want to encourage you this week, this may not be doable in these next seven days, but but you can set a date where you will open up your home, your table to gather friends or relatives or perhaps complete strangers. Maybe that neighbor that you've not yet gotten to know for the express purpose of creating opportunities to, to experience the gracious and welcoming heart of our God. And I don't, I'm not trying to overcomplicate this. This doesn't mean you've got to get them at your table and sit down and present the four spiritual laws. Invite them into your home and just love them well. Let them know this is a place where you are, you are welcomed and you are loved and it's a, it's a reflection of a greater love that God affords them. And then secondly, um, and or, gather with fellow followers of Jesus for a meal and celebrate purposefully. Celebrate God and his goodness in each other's lives. Ask yourselves this question. When you are seeing God's goodness and grace, where are you seeing it most clearly in your life right now? This morning, as we, as we conclude, we have the opportunity to come together to um, celebrate communion. N.T. Wright, when he was talking about this, he said, when, when Jesus wanted to teach his disciples about the significance of his death, he didn't give them a theory, he gave them a meal. See, today when we come to the communion table, we are reminded that Jesus, we are reminded of that grand invitation to God's banquet table through what Jesus has accomplished. This morning as you come to the table, I pray that you would know again, be reminded of the power of his grace and in doing so that he might equip us and enable us to live it out to the world around us. I'm going to pray for us, and then Pastor Bruce will come, and he will lead us in communion together. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the invitation that we have this morning to come and to remember, to remember your grand invitation, the body of Christ that was given for us, and the blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Meet us in this place. Continue to transform us by the power of your grace so that we might proclaim it to the world around us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.